Hi, everyone. You are all welcome to the first series of Mitigate Plus webinar on the approach to scaling CGIR innovations to, towards low emissions food systems. My name is Amanui George, and I coordinate the activities of the scaling work package of Mitigate Plus globally. Uh, as I understand that here we have colleagues from Mitigate Plus, uh, different CGIR initiative, as well as colleagues outside the CGIR. Please kindly introduce yourself, and you can do this by simply just typing your name and the program where you work, as well as your organization in the chat section of the webinar. Uh, before we proceed, uh, I would like to ask uh, the work package lead, Augusto, to uh, welcome us, like give us and give us a welcome note so that we can uh, proceed with the program of today. Agosto, please go ahead. Thank you all. Thank you for connecting to this important webinar. Uh, my name is Augusto Castro. I'm leading the work package for in Mitigate Plus. It's about scaling. Mm, now in, in Nairobi, I was participating in a meeting about a platform from the CEIR that wants to work on environmental health and biodiversity. And I think that this kind of webinars and the information we can share is useful for not only this type of platform, but as well, but all, for others like working on topics like climate, climate change adaptation, mitigation, gender, and other topics. So thank you. I don't want to take too much time. So George, go ahead, please. Thank you, Augusto. For the session of today, we are going to have three talking points. The first will be to look at the framework for determining food system drivers of greenhouse gas emissions. Then we will look at the methodology that uh, the scaling work package is using to determine the potential of their innovation to scale. And we will end this every webinar by looking at a case study of a CGIR innovation that is being implemented in Colombia. But before we start, permit me to use some few minutes of this time of your time just to give you a background of what uh, the scaling work package of Mitigate Plus is all about and what they are doing. Um, first, I would like to say that the Paris Agreement makes it clear that uh, countries globally have a responsibility to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This means that regardless of countries' development status, uh, everyone, every country has to commit to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in their respective economies. However, progress towards achieving these targets have been slow, and technologies as well as policies approaches do exist to to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but their low rate of adoption impedes their potential. And as well, the enabling institutional and social environments that are needed to achieve low emissions are not yet known. So because of these gaps, the scaling work package of Mitigate Plus aims to scale to, to select four CGIR innovations where they would create an enabling environment for scaling these innovations in, in the countries where Mitigate Plus is working. Aside from doing this, this work package will also document the carbon, the non-carbon benefits, the undesired spillover effects of these innovations. And they would as well look at uh, this, the barriers to scaling these innovation at the farm and value chain levels. And then lastly, the work package will look at institutional arrangements, policy approaches, and business models that exist to scaling these low emission food systems innovations in the various countries that Mitigate Plus is working. And for the first phase of this initiative, the scaling work package has as an outcome goal to look to make sure that interventions targeting climate sequestration and reduce greenhouse gas emissions through four CGIR technologies are demonstrated for their climate mitigation potential, and that investors, both at the national level and policymakers, are incentivized to emphasize low emissions food systems uh, um, in their respective economies through their NDCs from 2025 until 2030. 
It is often said that uh, to solve a problem sustainably, it, a good way to, to look at this is to first of all target the provide solutions based on the source and the causes of those problems. So the scaling work package of Mitigate Plus is using this approach whereby they first start by looking at the drivers of food systems, greenhouse gas emissions. So I would uh, pass over to my colleague Janelle to give us a presentation of what we are doing uh, in determining, in, in coming out with a framework for determining drivers of greenhouse gas emissions in the food systems. Uh, Janelle, can I just stop sharing my screen so that you can share your screen and proceed with your presentation? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, the classic question of, can you see my screen? <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> okay, great, wonderful. All right, um, hello everybody. Uh, I am Janelle Sylvester. Uh, I'm a research fellow at the Alliance of Bioversity and SEAT uh, based in Cali, Colombia. Uh, I'm in the low emission food systems team of uh, the Climate Action Lever, uh, where I serve as the biophysical lead um, and I'm also serving as the land expert for the environmental health and biodiversity impact platform uh, that Augusto previously mentioned. <clears throat> Um, today, I'm, as George introduced, uh, presenting a framework for um, uh, analyzing food system drivers of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and in this study, we focus specifically on um, <clears throat> emissions from deforestation. <clears throat> So um, the food system is currently a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions, and one third of the emissions from the food system uh, come from <clears throat> land use and land use change activities. Uh, so if we want to achieve low emission food systems, <clears throat> we need to not only understand the sources of the emissions, um, but also the, the dynamics behind the activities that are generating these emissions. <clears throat> when we talk about emissions from land use and land use change, um, <clears throat> you frequently hear mention of deforestation. Um, that's because uh, deforestation accounts for approximately 45% of the emissions coming from the AFOLU sector. <clears throat> now, the greatest direct driver of deforestation, the activity that contributes the most to driving deforestation, is the expansion of agriculture and livestock production. Therefore, if we want to reduce land-based emissions from the food system, uh, we need to address deforestation for food production. In order to do this, we need a better understanding of the underlying drivers, the indirect forces that drive deforestation for food production. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> if deforestation occurs for food production, uh, it can be considered as an outcome of the food system. The food system uh, encompasses uh, food system elements and activities and uh, the Food system outcomes uh, are the outputs of these activities. And this includes uh, food and nutrition security, uh, social and economic outcomes, as well as environmental outcomes. <clears throat> now, most of our understanding of deforestation and its underlying drivers comes from a land systems perspective. And we have yet to really look at deforestation through the lens of the food system. Uh, thus, we have a very little understanding of which dimensions of the food system are most influential in driving land use change and associated land-based emissions. Uh, such an understanding is critical for developing food system interventions that halt deforestation while achieving uh, other positive uh, outcomes, such as uh, increased food and nutrition security and other uh, positive social and economic outcomes. <clears throat> 
OK, so um, on to our framework. Um, <clears throat> to develop a framework that can be used to identify uh, the food system dimensions and dynamics uh, that are most influential in driving land-based emissions. We integrated drivers of food systems uh, based on the research of Christopher Benet uh, from the Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAT um, with the drivers of land systems based on the research from Geist and Lambon. Um, <clears throat> drivers are organized under the three food system dimensions uh, corresponding to consumption demand, production supply, and trade distribution. A fourth category was added to account for drivers of land systems that interact with food system dynamics uh, to drive deforestation for food production. Um, that is this last box here in blue. Um, However, in this study, uh, we will be focusing only on these first three uh, first three boxes corresponding to uh, the three dimensions of, of the food system. Um, so the idea is that by looking at and modeling um, drivers that shape food systems, uh, we can better understand how dynamics related to consumption demand, production supply, and trade distribution uh, contribute to driving deforestation as an outcome of the food system. Um, <clears throat> so we operationalized this framework um, at the global and regional scale uh, using a machine learning approach. Uh, we use data from 40 countries uh, with the highest rates of deforestation. Um, we included deforestation trends uh, coming from the Terra I deforestation monitoring uh, system, um, encompassing years from 2004 to 2021. Um, and we used the XGBoost um, algorithm, which is a, a gradient boosting algorithm, uh, to construct the models. Um, and we did so at, at the scale, at the global scale, as well as at the scale of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia. Um, to select our driver variables, uh, we did an exhaustive search. Um, data had to be uh, time series and uh, cross-sectional data um, for it to be included in the models. And we set a, a cutoff threshold of 20% uh, uh, in terms of um, missing data observations. So variables that had more than 20% uh, of um, data missing and um, that did not um, serve as time series or cross-sectional data uh, could not be included in models, um, <clears throat> which uh, in the end resulted with um, 12, 12 variables that, that we included to uh, represent the different dimensions. Um, <clears throat> you can see here we have three driver categories from the three um, dimensions that have uh, representative uh, variables, proxies um, that we included in the models. Um, we couldn't include uh, variables for all of the driver categories in our framework due to the data limitations, um, which is a significant hurdle for any kind of modeling uh, at the scale. Um, <clears throat> but uh, overall, we uh, still had uh, very strong model outputs, um, <clears throat> especially at, uh, well, global Asia and Latin America had uh, very strong models. They were able to explain um, more than 70% of the observed variation in uh, tree cover loss. Um, <clears throat> and we found that uh, at the global level, um, variables related to uh, consumption demand and trade distribution were most important in uh, explaining um, uh, observed deforestation during this period. And more specifically, um, rural population um, which was perfectly, it's rural population decline, uh, which was perfectly correlated with urban population growth. Uh, here it's serving as a proxy um, for urban population growth and urbanization. Um, <clears throat> that variable alongside foreign direct investments um, explained, uh, most explained deforestation at the global level. Um, we also found that uh, for Latin America, um, GDP of exports uh, and foreign direct investments uh, were the two uh, uh, most important explanatory variables at that scale. 
Um, in, in Asia, uh, it was as well rural population decline, urban population growth, uh, and elevation, which was considered a uh, biphysical variable. Um, and uh, for Africa, uh, which was, uh, it was, did not explain as much uh, deforestation as the other models, um, most likely because we could not, uh, due to data limitations, could not include uh, variables related to uh, governance um, and other land related issues. Um, <clears throat> but of the de deforestation that was explained, uh, population growth was more important than um, rural population decline, um, uh, illustrating the uh, different population dynamics um, being seen in Africa, um, <clears throat> as well as uh, food exports. Um, <clears throat> and um, so overall, if we take it back to the global scale, um, <clears throat> looking at the importance of uh, urban population growth and foreign direct investments, um, these findings are uh, very important because uh, a lot of our efforts to curb deforestation uh, have focused a great deal on um, <clears throat> on zero deforestation supply chains, on uh, on international exports, on trade regulations. Um, <clears throat> however, our results suggest that uh, we should complement these efforts uh, with interventions focused on urban demand, um, <clears throat> on domestic consumption. Um, and that uh, currently the role of foreign direct investments in influencing land use change uh, is not clear. We, 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 don't, we don't know um, <clears throat> uh, fully the, the dynamics um, behind, behind these foreign direct investments um, and how they influence uh, land use change. Uh, thus, more research is needed to, to better understand this um, so that we can uh, develop uh, reg trade regu I'm sorry, investment regulations, um, safeguards to uh, more effectively uh, mitigate uh, deforestation as an outcome of the food system. And that is it. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate um, your attention. Thank you very much, Janelle, for that rich presentation on food systems drivers of deforestation. I think from here, we will give some few minutes for people to ask questions to Janelle, and then we move to the next presentation. Please feel free to ask your question, your doubts, your inputs to Janelle, so we can handle them now before we move to the next presentation. Um, yes, I see a comment from Wei. Hi, Wei. <laughs> Hi, Wei. Hi, Wei. I see a comment from you. Um, I will. I'll just go ahead and answer that one. Um, yeah, it would. I'll have to look at that that data set. But we did. We. I mean, the World Bank. The World Bank and FAO stat were our principal. Um, data sources. And it's most likely, I mean, we reviewed uh, all the possible variables and it's very likely that uh, that one was considered but didn't have enough uh, data observations um, to be included. Uh, would also love to include a variable related to conflict, um, <clears throat> but the as well, the, the data limitations for that prevented us from including that in models. But um, hopefully over time, um, data limitations will will be reduced. And um, what's great about this framework is that you can apply it at different uh, different scales, different levels. Um, and we're currently working on uh, applying it at the national scale for Colombia um, and Peru uh, using municipality level data. So um, one could do the same if uh, a country has that kind of fine scale data for conflict or other governance variables. Um, Yes. No. Daniel, you have a question from Noel. So, no, Noel. Thanks. Noel, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good morning or, or afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, first, just a comment that I don't know if I'm the only one who joined via the web app, and so I don't have access to the chat feature. Um, 
can't put anything into the chat, also can't see what's going on in the chat. So just kind of for your awareness. I was curious about uh, your comment. Well, first, thanks for that. You know, I think that's a really interesting take that most of our uh, analysis and maybe recommendations and, and actions about addressing deforestation haven't really taken into account the food system uh, you know, in, in its entirety. I was, but, but some of the variables you mentioned are ones that I think people are thinking about and urban consumption is one. You know, I, I don't think that that's something that people are unaware of. I think it's more that it's hard to know what to do about it. And I was wondering whether, how far your thinking had gone in that area. Uh, you know, have you, did you do some consultations with uh, stakeholders, either, you know, municipal governments or, or residents of fast growing populations, uh, you know, other organizations, either NGOs or, or governments that had been trying to wrestle with this to say, if you're going to address urban consumption as a driver uh, of an eventual driver of land use change, what, how would you actually go about it? And where are the barriers that we're running up against? Yes, um, that is a, a great question. All very great points. Um, I think the consultations would be uh, considered as a next step. Um, and yes, you are completely correct that uh, this it's it's not new. Um, it has uh, it is gaining recognition in terms of uh, being a driver of deforestation, uh, like urbanization, associated lifestyle changes, and and grow, growing urban populations. Um, I do think one thing that we Mm, still haven't quite fully dissected is the differentiation between like domestic consumption uh, versus uh, what is coming from international, uh, what's coming from imports or, or international trade. Um, <clears throat> for example, the Latin America model um, GDP of exports was uh, highly significant, but it was also inversely correlated, um, suggesting that uh, that well, it could suggest several things, but I think um, it's to say that there's been a lot of focus on on uh, the demand in foreign or in uh, other other regions, other countries, um, whereas it seems like the growing domestic demand is uh, deserving of more attention. Um, in terms of what to do about that, um, I, I think about it a lot. I mean, I think the it ties very much with any any efforts to influence consumer behavior. Um, really, I, I mean, the, you know, education within urban areas um, uh, would be would obviously be a, a great uh, part of that. Um, and I don't know other interventions and in, and in what is being what is being offered in, in urban areas and increasing the understanding of where our food come, comes from, what our food sources are and the impact that they have, hopefully maybe could have a, could have a beneficial impact. But I'm open to any ideas from anybody else as well. <laughs> Well, I, I apologize if I put you on the spot a little bit. I mean, it's a tough question, right? I think that that's part of why I asked it, since in part it's part of what your study is, you know, at least as I heard the presentation is is encouraging us to focus on. And I think we're all to some extent a little bit stuck. Uh, you know, it's pretty tough to uh, tell a population what they should eat. Uh, and yet we know that uh, marketing has an influence our on our behavior in lots of ways. Uh, USA has a program in Malawi right now, which is more about charcoal demand as a driver of deforestation. But part of that is an urban education program about the safety of uh, you know, of, of different kinds of stoves uh, in homes. So you know, I think that there is some education piece, but I'm also always a little bit wary of an answer that is a um, behavior change that's exclusively about you know, any party telling another party we're going to educate you. you know, there's a little bit of kind of um, not quite as much humility as I think we'd all like to see in that. Uh, so I was just curious how far your team had gotten. And maybe the answer is our job here is to do the analysis and we need a partner to think through what the appropriate interventions would be. I really didn't mean to put you on the spot too much. Yeah, 
No, no, not on the spot at all. And 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 yeah, I mean, it, we definitely do need to uh, do more analyses. Um, and I mean, one other aspect of the findings is the the role of foreign direct investments um, in driving land use change, and um, that can link to uh, having beneficial investments. Um, and maybe there's a role uh, for investments in 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 reducing this uh, environmental impact of growing urban populations or consumption in urban areas. Um, <clears throat> so that that is something we, that's one of our other next steps is uh, not only better understanding the role of these investments, but also how investments can be uh, flipped into um, being beneficial, driving positive outcomes of the food system. Thank you all. I see Augusto's hand is up. Uh, please, Augusto, go ahead, and you have just <laughs> 90 seconds. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. It's kind of to, to continue the response to Noel. It's, it's, uh, nice to see you, Noel. And we are drive, we, we are developing solutions for this issue in the team of the low emission food systems. Uh, what we are trying to do is to connect consumption with these drivers of deforestation. We are understanding, for instance, that although global level consumption drives deforestation in the global south, a huge part of the deforestation is connected with local level consumption. Also, we are understanding that things like variables like livestock production, although connected and driving directly deforestation, are also connected with other variables such as nutrition, uh, child and their nutrition specifically. So, based on this understanding, we are we are in, in, uh, implementing some some actions, some some tests, some some pilots uh, in Colombia, and the idea is to extrapolate these results to other continents and other uh, countries of the Mitigate Plus um, initiative. So, thank you. Thank you, Augusto. Uh, I see that there are some more questions, but because of time constraint, we wouldn't be able to take all these questions. Please, uh, you can send an email to Janelle and ask her your question, and I'm sure she can provide you with more information on that. And Janelle, please leave your email in the chat so that people can feel free to reach out to you to obtain more information about this presentation, give inputs, or ask questions to you. So yes. next, and, um, we... also I, sorry, George, I, I suggest since some since people are not able to access the chat, uh, some at least, um, will send a follow up email as well with uh, with my with our contact info and and any other relevant information from the chat. Yes, yes, we will send that with the contacts of all the presenters of today. Thank you. Okay, so next we will hear from Leonard, who will be presenting about the methodology for determining the potential of an innovation to scale. So Leonard, please go ahead. You have 10 minutes for the presentation, and after that we have five minutes for questioning. Thank you. All right, thanks. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, uh, George, and thank you everyone on the Mitigate team for this opportunity. My name is Leonard Woltering. I work for CIMIT, I work for GIZ, and recently also for the Wageningen University. Uh, and I'm presenting here about, first I want to say some words about scaling and then about the scaling scan that we uh, developed. So there is a very persistent scaling logic all over the world, especially in international development, um, very much coming from the private sector. Uh, is that you discover something, you do a proof of concept, you pilot it, and then you scale it. And then if you scale it, you reach the sustainable development goals. The idea behind it is that success on small scale leads automatically to success on a large scale. And it's just a matter of diffusion. More people using that particular innovation will uh, give uh, lead us to the sustainable development goals. It is also a winning argument for donors, implementers, policymakers for many decades, at least since the 1960s with uh, Rogers. It's been a very popular idea. But uh, we keep finding over and over again that innovations and pilots, they hardly ever scale. Secondly, the good stuff doesn't really hold. Uh, there are many ideas, and especially if we look at climate change, many of the issues that have to do with climate change are a result of scaling. Scaling agriculture, as Janelle was showing, uh, leads to deforestation. Uh, scaling of use of cars leads to well, climate change, if you want. Then um, 
there are a few reasons for that. And, and one, one of them is that the context is king. We need to be much more aware that the context is king. So it's not so much about the qualities of the innovation, but it's more about the context that determines if something can scale. And that does, is not reflected in that uh, scaling logic. It's very much focused on the innovation to scale, whereas actually it's about the context that makes something scale or not. A second idea is scaling is not a linear process. And one way to explain it is by showing a Dutch example of a bicycle where you can have one woman on the bike, but if you want to scale that, you can have more people on the bike. It's still possible, but there are limitations to that. And then you need to change vehicle. You need to learn how to drive. You need to go from the sidewalk to the road. You need a, a driver's license, etc., and so on. And if you want to scale more, you need to get into another vehicle again. So you need a, maybe a bus bus stop at some kind of station somewhere. You need a ticketing system, etc. So it's the same with scaling. You cannot just extrapolate the success of what you had in the uh, pilot project to say, well, we just do more of the same and that will lead to the bigger outcomes. Because scaling is not a bigger bicycle. It's not an ex a linear process. There are different roles and phases um, and skills required. And there are also different innovations involved in that scaling process. And of course, different actors and collaborators that you need to engage with. So just to kind of summarize very briefly, uh, what we know now uh, in 2023, innovations basically fail to scale. And there are a lot of wrong assumptions about scaling. The idea that everything should scale, everything can scale. Uh, scaling is good. Scaling is sustainable. Scaling is transformative. And many misconceptions around um, the idea. And the funny thing is actually that the literature has been very clear for more than three dec decades, there's too much focus on the innovation and the innovator. If you see the, the bicycle, it's right, probably the first person on that bicycle was the innovator and said, okay, we can do this for everyone and not on the system, the local actors, the norms, the relationships, the mindset, uh, the history in which the innovations will be embedded. And the big problem is actually that this problem is, is very big. You know, the, a lot of people are not buying into a different way of looking at scaling. They're very much influenced by the idea of adoption of innovation as uh, leading to scaling, as leading to good results. No? And there's an urgent need that we change the way that we look at scaling. So it's a, it's a double transformation. The transformation of our food systems need a transformation in the way that we think and do and act on, on scaling. And one of the insights uh, that we keep getting is that this systems perspective, system thinking are very good methods to deal with the complexity of, of scaling. So we thought, OK, how can we operationalize some of these ideas? How can you bring in a, a stronger systems perspective into the scaling discussion? And then in 2017, we came up with the, the scaling scan. Uh, as a tool to to do that. And we recently, this year, two weeks ago, we launched the third edition together with colleagues from the Alliance, GIZ, FAO, and, uh, and, and SNV and others. Uh, but the idea here is that because the problem is so big, we want an accessible tool so that many, many people can get a better grip of what scaling is and should be. Uh, so we, we translated it in French, English, and Spanish. It's very experience based, opposed to, for example, scaling readiness, another methodology used in the CGIR a lot, which is very evidence based. This is a bit, uh, let's say, earlier in the process, more of an experience based tool and different kind of durations, digital and live, etc. I'll just say the three steps that it's built off. It's, it's about defining a scaling ambition. And the best you do this is to do this with stakeholders that you're working with. So let them decide also what good scaling is, what enough is, et cetera, et cetera. So it is about not only about what you want to scale, but also in the context. So where do you want to scale? For whom? Do you want to do this for women group or do you want this to do this for, let's say, rich men? Uh, do you want to do this? Um, well, in what kind of areas do you want to do this? Then you also have a, a responsibility check. 
saying, okay, what if you reach this scaling ambition? What are the implications for the environment, for climate change, and for social issues. I'll come back to that point a, a little bit later. And then you go to the core of the tool, which basically says, OK, the enabling environment for scaling is important. Context is king. Um, so yes, the technology practice has to be good. No, this is the Rogers idea of OK, the technology attributes. But there are nine other ingredients which also have to be in place for something to scale. This, the context has to be conducive for scaling. So. People need to be aware, there needs to be demand, there needs to be also business models, not only for, let's say, the farmer, but especially also for the intermediaries to keep doing this without us, right? Without the project, without external funding, etc. Are there collaboration mechanisms in place that uh, make sure that the scaling can continue and grow, etc.? So we devised tactical questions for each of these ingredients so that people could score the status of that, so you kind of model it. So for example, here uh, in this example, we had 30 people in a workshop and say, well, the technology is actually pretty good, but the, really the bottlenecks are around a value chain for that uh, innovation to, to come out into the market and also business models, etc. cetera. No? So that gives you then an indication, well, maybe this is something that we should focus on. And what we see very often is that people keep investing in tweaking and improving the technology or the innovation uh, and not so much spend time on the bottlenecks, mostly finance or business models, because it's also not part of their expertise often. So the scaling is actually held back by issues that they don't really have control over. No? And this is a way, for example, in a workshop to do that very visually and participatory. Now, we have the, the methodology. I, I will put the, the link in the chat. Uh, there's a website and it explains very nicely how you can do it. There's a very easy version that you can just do online, even on your phone. You can just click through, you can scan this, but I don't want to spend too much time on that here in that uh, in this uh, presentation. I just want to give a few impressions of how we've used it. So again, social issues are important. We are dealing with big changes if things go to scale. Uh, you can do it in virtual settings, etc. And some of the partners that are using it now George is uh, part of the team. We developed a third edition uh, where we said, OK, we need to focus much more on social inclusion and, and climate change because it was kind of geared towards, OK, how do you scale more uh, with very little attention to, OK, well, what are the implications of that? So we developed some uh, ideas and principles which we then integrated throughout the tool. So. If you if you want to try it out, you will see that uh, that is much stronger now. And then through the digital initiative, the DX initiative, there's also a course on the scaling scan coming available uh, this uh, next month. So there's another opportunity to learn about this now. Specifically on climate change in the third edition. So what we said, OK, well, what is the most important in this environmental and climate change issues? And we came up with these four um principles that are very important for for climate change and scaling so sustainable resource use it's great if for example you do solar powered irrigation it may be a great benefit for the farmer but if everybody starts to do it you probably drain down the water table very quickly and other users are suffering from that so sustainable resource use you don't often see that at the pilot level but you see that at scale. So what are you, can you do now to prevent issues coming up later? Trade-offs and uncertainty. I think uh, Augusto always has this very nice example of uh, what if, uh, say, Colombia stops, okay, with no more cows because of climate change, but then all the cows move to Brazil. In that sense, at the global level, you didn't solve anything, right? You just maybe, for the sake of Colombia, you kind of uh, mitigated something. Uh, climate mitigation, of course, uh, and then climate adaptation, we also added as, as important principles uh, throughout throughout the tool. So my conclusions, I hope I'm still within the time, uh, uh, George. Um, reaching the sustainable development goals requires us to scale innovations that improve the system, that we leave something better behind than what we found, right? Uh, often projects make a lot of changes within a kind of like a, their control environment and the system is not changed at all, right? There is no bigger implication for the way things are going. Um, 
the scaling scan guys use it systematically through some of those key issues um, uh, and, and it helps you think through some critical issues for scaling. You know? And it exposes the bottlenecks and enables discussion and action. So again, it's evidence based. So it's really also very much about the process, who you invite, who you get all around the table to discuss these issues and have a bit of a uh, maybe a different view on scaling than everybody has in their head when they start with a scaling workshop. Right. So yeah, I would like to leave it like uh, with that, and I'm happy to take some questions and discuss further because this is a, a, a very, I think. Um, yeah, interesting topic, and uh, yeah, it always leads to a very strong discussion. So I'm really happy to to engage with that. Uh, thank you, George. Thank you, Lynette, for that wonderful presentation. I think we leave it now for the audience to ask you some few questions. Then we move to the last part of this program. Please feel free to ask your questions to Lynette. And we can take some few minutes to to handle this. Yes, I see Swana's hand. Please, Cornelis, please go ahead with your question. Yes, thanks. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can okay. hear you very well. OK, thanks. Uh, first, I was invited by um, uh, for this for this uh, initiative uh, webinar, so it's it's quite interesting to see. I was uh, interested what the difference is between the innovation readiness readiness approach and scaling scaling readiness approach and this approach because I I find it quite interesting, but I think at, at, at the same time through the CG and some other uh, initiatives, there's other types of, of scaling approaches being pushed. I would almost say. Um, and I was actually quite interested uh, in what you presented, so I would like to to hear maybe, and also because you have a connection with Wagner, and I'm just wondering what is the main difference, and how would you see that in in how do they relate to each other? Uh, do you see that they that they may merge at certain time, or do they actually focus on some different elements so that they could be used partly, you know, next to each other? Or yeah, some further elaboration on that would be useful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, great. That's a great question and, and something that uh, actually last week again, I talked to Mark about this, that we need to write up something on that. So uh, there is space for both. I think the scaling scan is 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 um, experience based, whereas the scaling readiness is more evidence based. So you spend a lot more time in finding out, OK, is this really like that, etc. No? This is more like a discussion tool. Uh, I think the second difference is is that the scaling scan is is kind of low entry. It's really geared to get that discussion of scaling away from the project leaders and away from the academics to the local actors that are involved and actually affected by scaling. Whereas the scaling readiness is still kind of considered as something very elaborate and uh, yeah, something very you know that uh, requires quite some knowledge about scaling and about the processes. No, so it it. Ilri used it, I think, in a very nice way. They said, OK, before you get into the elaborate process of the scaling readiness, which can take three days, for example, why don't you do a pre-selection or, or kind of like a pre-scalability assessment using the scaling scan? If you feel that there's energy there, there's interest, then go through the scaling uh, readiness methodology. And I think that's a very sensible uh, approach. So it's low entry. Um, in, in many ways more accessible and the scaling range is much more thorough and it will give you much more uh, ideas about how to do, how to, how to strategize around this, how to implement, how to use this in your implementation strategy. Whereas the scaling scan kind of gives you hints, okay, this is maybe an area of concern, uh, but not much more than that. No? It helps very much to get people on board, I would say. Once they're on board, uh, it will be very good to do the scaling readiness. Yeah. Yeah, so it could be a tool more maybe on a participatory level actually to 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 explore what areas um yeah especially the contextual issues which are relevant which are important and how to work on that together with partners uh, um yeah let me think exactly. about it it's, it's about yeah. that it's also about opening a mindset about 
people always start going into a workshop thinking about scaling is okay we have one innovation we want more of that that's kind of their idea of scaling and then through that you have a lot of aha moments like oh i didn't know it's also finance is also important for this but i've never heard of this or maybe we should collaborate with others so it's also really about kind of like provoking a bit of uh thinking about uh, about this. There's also another tool, Gender Up, which is also focused on scaling, but very much focused on the social uh, dimension of it. So we are looking at, okay, how can you use a scaling scan and then maybe scaling readiness and then the Gender Up as kind of in combination. But yeah, they're they are in the same biosphere of the CJR and they're, they're living alongside each other, filling different needs, I would say, yeah. Okay, thanks. Lena, if you have a question from from Ruth, and she asked um, from the chat. So she said, um, it's very interesting. Can you say more about how the responsibility check has worked out? Does it ever lead to a change in innovation? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think it, it helps people kind of um, reverse engineer what they want to do. Um, it is in a way, uh, the word escaped me now, but there's a methodology to, to work backwards, right? So you basically say, what if you reach your scaling ambition? You say, this is so fantastic, we need to do that. What are the effects on women on a larger scale? What are the effects on the environment? So people kind of say, Ooh, maybe there are limits to growth, no? Kind of <laughs> to link it up to that. So maybe we shouldn't scale to a maximum level. But maybe we should scale to a little bit less or what is actually more common say oof, we actually never thought about it let's maybe investigate a bit more or they say okay we never thought about it let's continue anyway uh, but with that a little bit more in mind so I, I don't really have evidence where people said okay you know we uh, did this and then based on based on the responsibility check we kind of cut it here but yeah, it, it really makes people think and broaden the horizon a little bit and to say, well, maybe those gender people are not that crazy. Maybe we should involve them in the project because there may be a very big issue around social inclusion when this goes to scale or if this goes to scale. So I don't have a very concrete example on that, but but it's really about uh, yeah, creating more awareness. Now with the third edition, I think we try to be a bit more uh, a bit more concrete about what these issues are and then included also elements of climate mitigation and climate adaptation more strongly. Um, so I hope that it will change the idea that, okay, we should always go for the more and best and, and, and you know, uh, maximum scale, but rather go to an optimal scale where social and environmental issues kind of are, yeah, the trade-offs between them are kind of uh, acceptable. No, from whoever can say what acceptable is here. Thank you, Linda. Ruth, I hope that uh, was a bit clear, sorry. Yeah, so because of time constraint, please bear with us that we will not be able to take all questions. I see that Leonard has put the link to the scaling scan in the chat section. Uh, you can visit this uh, link, this website to learn more about the scaling scan. And you can as well uh, send an email to Leonard and after this meeting, we will be sending a follow-up email with all the emails of the presenters. So um, please bear with us to take this meeting over, over um, time by five to seven minutes because we, we took some more time for this discussion. So Elisa, please go ahead with your presentation about a case study of an innovation that is being implemented in Colombia. Thank you. On mute. <laughs> All right, let me share my screen. Uh, all right, everyone can see my screen, uh, the, the presentation. George, could you see my screen? Yes, 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 I all can right, see your so, screen. Thank you. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's here. And I am going to have a brief presentation on uh, the implementation of an innovation from that emerged from CGIR. Uh, actually uh, under the Alliance of Biodiversity and uh, International CIAT uh, that's leading this uh, project from where the innovation comes from, uh, emerged from, uh, toward low emission development. And this is based on our experience in Colombia. Uh, so uh, 
So to most of you, uh, I, I am known as the engagement lead uh, for Mitigate Plus, but actually I'm also a value chain social scientist for work package four, uh, which is on scaling uh, the scaling work package. So before I go into what the innovation is, uh, let me give you the history. So the, the, this uh, innovation that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes uh, is, uh, is emerged from the project known as a for short, Sustainable Land Use System uh, project, uh, which is a project uh, funded by the German Germany's International Climate Initiative. And this is about implementing sustainable agricultural and uh, livestock production systems with a view of uh, delivering uh, climate mitigation, uh, forest conservation, promoting forest conservation and peace building in Colombia. If you hover over the QR code, it will take you to the microsite, which it, you will find there all the, the results of the project, uh, which uh, recently we actually had a webinar. Uh, this is a blog that was published yesterday that I wrote. Uh, and one of the people who actually spoke there uh, is the policy advisor for the Fe German Federal Ministry for the Environment and Nature Conservation nuclear safety and consumer protection and and uh, and and her name is Ruth Ireland and she said that funding this uh, project which i believe was the source of a lot of innovations uh was a very wise decision for the german government and there's a qr code here again that if you hover over it it will take you to actually a page on the mitigate plus microsite which features the whole um webinar uh, where you will actually find more in detail um, the, the innovation, which is actually the implementation of it is being led by a colleague named Carlos Borda. Um, and so if you hover over that, you will go to that uh, page again and to that you can uh, watch the recording of the webinar. So what is this innovation that we're talking about? We're talking about this framework on scaling out sustainable land use system practices, which in ha which features three major components. One is to identify sustainable land use system practices. Uh, what that means, of course, is that uh, this would be practices that should meet uh, the sustainability criteria, and that would be, in the case of producers' uh, production systems, it should be both profitable and good for the environment, but at the same time, it would be the farm, the producers that should be at the helm or managing these practices. The second component is to identify economic and financial instruments um, that would fit the context of, of the producers, um, and then engage with stakeholders uh, to understand the, the challenges as well as opportunities for scaling um, of, of the sustainable land use practices. So that so here that would not only include the producers but also the government uh, as well as the funders. So I so I wrote uh, together with some colleagues uh, within the. Uh, within SIAT, particularly the low emission food system sublever, um, which Augusto Caso leads, uh, about this framework. Uh, and that what we what uh, this policy brief uh, is saying that, yes, Colombia has a lot of, uh, has not a lot, but has incentives towards sustainable agriculture, but not all of them could fit the context of cocoa producers uh, in Colombia. Uh, because some instruments uh, to for right financing, uh, they would need to have clear uh, land tenure, um, uh, land ownership, which is an issue in Colombia. So, but there are some that actually could fit. And before I go any further, what that uh, instrument is, uh, this is where where uh, the innovation is being implemented, which is in Caqueta. Um, uh, Cafeta uh, Department in Colombia, which has, which has actually, you know, uh, is affected by both deforestation and um, and conflict. And this photo is a photo I took when I went to Belen de los, uh, Belen de los Andaquies, and this is a, a photo of a, a cocoa agroforest. Um, and the innovation is in being implemented together with uh, with producers uh, in Belen, uh, cocoa producers in Belen, Belen de Rosinquias, Queta. So what is this instrument that I'm talking about? And I've been talking about it with some people, and this is what is known as the Obras por Impuestos. 
Uh, this is a mechanism established under the tax reform law of uh, 2016 in Colombia. And it is uh, uh, available to companies that have for a particular year earned about 33,610 UVT. UVT is a unit of taxation in Colombia, which is equivalent to around 320,000 US dollars uh, for this year. And the companies that are eligible for this could elect to invest half of the taxes attached to that uh, income um, toward payment for ecosystem services. In areas affected by both, con uh, in areas uh, covered under the programas de, de desarrollo con enfoque territorial, uh, which is a program that is uh, supporting the implementation of rural reform uh, law and as well as the peace agreement of 2016. So what Carlos Borda is leading in terms of the efforts here is that he is working with the government, particularly the Ministry of the Environment, as well as with the producers to structure a project that could be financed under Obras for Impuestos. So there's already a project that's being developed uh, to structure that. Uh, because the producers um, needed support in, in doing so, so that they could access financing. And the, the next step uh, from what I heard is for that project to be registered in this registry uh, for that is being uh, managed by the Agencia de Renovación uh, de territor del Territorio. Um, and you can see here, I, I don't know how many projects, but because I filtered the projects, uh, there are two projects right now that are uh, that are under payment for ecosystem uh, classified as payment for ecosystem services schemes, um, but the idea is, of course, for for this project that we are working with, uh, particularly Car Carlos Borda, uh, to to get into this uh, registry. So, with that, actually, that's the whole uh, presentation. Uh, um, I am actually speaking on behalf of Carlos Borda. So. Um, so that's uh, that's how we are implementing this particular innovation that came from that emerged from the work that we are de doing under sustainable land use system project, which is on its final year. We are going to have some activities, including the one that probably you've seen on social media. Uh, we're now we're reviewing some of the applications for the sustainable cocoa challenge in Colombia. With that, thank you, and over to you, George. Thank you, Elisa, for that wonderful presentation. And we leave the floor to the audience to ask some questions and doubts to Elisa about the innovation, if there are any. Please go ahead if you have questions. Any question for Elisa? Okay, uh, in the absence of questions, um, I would call on Augusto to give a closing remark to this webinar and yeah. I wanna thank the three presenters, uh, Janelle, Leonard and Elisa for this presentation. This is a bit of what we are doing at Work Package 4 of Mitigate Plus. Um, the Elisa, Elisa, the work that Elisa pre is presenting now, although was started with a different project and with different funding, is now being continued. Thank you to the support of Mitigate Plus, um, the initiative of the CGIR. Uh, we will keep, keep you posted about new advances in our research and how are we implementing the results of our research to achieve the goals of the CGIR and the Alliance and our partners, uh, in particular to let you know how we are contributing to mitigating climate change in the food systems and how we are integrating a social and environmental aspects such as gender, uh, peace building, uh, social cohesion when we scale technologies and innovations for reducing such emissions. So that's all from my side. Thank you so much, George, for facilitating the dialogue and for leading this um, this work, this this webinar. Uh, hope is not the last. Uh, hope we can have some other webinars soon on our work. 
Um, thank you. Thank you, Augusto, and thank you, dear participants. Uh, I just want to say that this is just a first series of Mitigate Plus webinars. Other webinars will be coming up to showcase what other work packages within Mitigate Plus will be doing. So stay connected with us. We will be sending you emails uh, and invitations to attend webinars to showcase uh, the works of other work packages of Mitigate Plus. And of course, we will also give you uh, webinars about uh, the further research and activities that we are doing at Work Package 4 of Mitigate Plus. So to this, I say thank you. And we will send a follow-up email with all the contact details of the presenters so that you can reach out to them and ask questions or um, connect with them or ask insights, more insights about the presentations that were made today. So thank you very much. I hope to see you in the upcoming sessions of the webinars of Mitigate Plus. Thank you. Thank you.